Welcome, everybody. Thanks for taking time to join us today. Today, we're going to be talking about the benefits and cost savings to improve productivity and scalability of your manufacturing operations. Our big idea today is how to leverage Ignition's open infrastructure for future growth and expansion. The benefits of a, sorry. Before we get started, I just wanted to mention what I hope you will gain from this webinar. The benefits of eliminating paper records. We will discuss how improved accuracy, digital records, and automatic integration with an ERP system has a variety of financial benefits. We'll just talk about using technology to get more value from your employees. We often hear about companies focusing on what they are good at. This webinar will talk about how allowing operators to focus on operating equipment allows for improved OEE, happier employees, and reduced training costs. We will also talk about how to expand your ignition system. Two of my favorite benefits of ignition are how easy it is to connect to things and the unlimited architecture options it has. We will talk about how to leverage an existing installation and infrastructure to achieve quick wins. Just a few things before we get started. I know we spend a lot of time on conference call these days, but please take some time to eliminate distractions. I find I listen best when I have something to fidget with, but whatever helps you is what's important. The chat set up on the webinar is private, so feel free to ask any questions. Our moderator will read them and Kevin and I will answer them at the end. Any questions we do not get to, I will personally reach out to you via email afterwards. The webinar is being recorded and everyone registers will get a link to the recording as well as copies of these slides following it. So some introductions. My name is Ryan Thompson. I'm Director of Client Solutions for Grantech. I've been with Grantech just over 12 years now and like to describe myself as a recovering automation engineer. I opened our office in South Florida in 2017 to support our growing business in the US Southeast. However, I work with a variety of clients all over the United States and Canada. For anyone who does not know Grantech, we have been delivering automation, IT, and Industry 4.0 solutions to our customers for 40 years, with eight offices around North America and one in India. We are an inductive automation enterprise and premier integrator. With that, I will pass things off to Kevin to introduce himself and talk about inductive automation. Thanks, Ryan. So my name is Kevin McCluskey. I'm co-director of sales engineering at Inductive Automation. It's good to be talking to everyone here today. Uh, I joined the inductive team back in 2011, um, and I've been working with uh, customers for, as you can see, <laughs> countless ignition projects. Uh, we, you know, I've worked with hundreds of customers over the years who are doing everything from automotive to pharmaceutical to oil and gas and everything in between. We can go ahead and uh, advance it, Ryan. That would be great. So a little bit about inductive automation. Our mission statement is simply as follows. Our mission is to create industrial software that empowers our customers to swiftly turn great ideas into reality by removing all technological and economic obstacles. And we really take this to heart. This is our North Star. This is our guiding principle for our company. We have an integrator program that ends up uh, adding to the reach that we have around the world. And in fact, our whole company started with the idea of integrators in mind. Our founder CEO, Steve Heckman, was the owner of a systems integration company and comes from integrator roots. And so when we started inductive automation, we started with the integrator in mind uh, and started an integrator program where we have integrators that are at different levels. Uh, we have a strong partnership with these integrators. Um, for the integrators, uh, they're going through and working with our tech support department. Uh, uh, there aren't any upfront costs to the integrator program. And the important thing here really is that uh, you can go all the way from a registered integrator up to a premier integrator, which are the different levels of certification. Uh, we happen to be happy to be on the call here today with Grantech as Grantech is one of our premier integrators and in fact um, has a specialization in enterprise as well. Uh, so uh, creme de la crop of our integrator program, uh, that's where Grantech sits in this whole thing. We have over 2,000 integrators around the world. 
So we have a whole variety of local support, even if uh, you know folks are over in very remote countries. Um, and then we have integrators who have worldwide reach as well, uh, including Grantic. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so our product is called Ignition. Inductive Automation as a company is a single product company. Uh, we actually have a lot of different Ignition modules and we do offer training and um, some support contracts and things like that. But in terms of our software offerings, we offer a software called Ignition. Ignition has a lot of features inside it. Uh, and some of the highlights of Ignition for the Ignition platform is the unlimited licensing model, cross-platform compatibility. So Windows, Linux, o OS 10 um, will run on all of those. And then mobile devices as well, if you're looking to take a, you know, clients from your phone or from home or from in the office or you know, over Wi-Fi, uh, you can run all of that. Uh, it's based on IT standard technologies, which is really important for us and for a lot of IT departments. Uh, it talks to things like uh, databases, SQL databases, which are really standard on the IT side, uh, very common protocols that are in use. Uh, it all runs over Ethernet and TCP IP. And um, I don't want to lose anyone with the actual technology names, but it's uh, that's one of the important pieces as well here. Uh, that uh, it'll communicate over web services and other standards that IT departments are uh, have come to expect. Also has the ability to do encryption and other security technologies that also are IT standard. Scalable server client architecture uh, means that you can run with a single server and have multiple different clients, or you can run with multiple different servers uh, if you want to or you need to. And so it's scalable to be able to go for a as small as a mom and pop shop, um, all the way up to enterprise architectures with hundreds or thousands of locations around the world. The web managed and web launched nature of Ignition help make it accessible anywhere. We have both a web client and a full rich desktop client. Uh, both of those are available to launch over the web and to pull into um, or, or over the network. Some, some folks take a look at web managed and web launched and uh, think that that means that it has to run online. That's not the case. So Ignition runs on premise for probably 90% of our customers and about 10%, which is not a small number of customers, but at about 10% are running um, uh, cloud hosted. Uh, as well. So we've seen a movement in that direction from some folks, but still most folks are running inside their own networks or in a corporate data center. Uh, and then Ignition is modular. So it has module, modular configurability where different features can be essentially turned on or off. Uh, you can choose the features that you want and that you need inside Ignition in these modules. And we develop these modules and we sell these modules for Ignition. Uh, and they do everything from uh, the visualization all the way to reporting, all the way to alarming, um, and as you'll see in a second, to uh, ERP connections as well. Thanks. Uh, the way that we generally think of Ignition is at the center of an ecosystem. So. You can see here Ignition is connecting out to a variety of different things. This isn't to say that you can't run Ignition alongside other things. We have plenty of folks who are doing that. Uh, but in terms of data collection and in terms of sending data out and making data available uh, and communicating out to devices, uh, PLCs, other RTUs, other devices, connecting to databases, uh, connecting to LIMS equipment, for example, lab equipment, uh, going out over MQTT or um, OPC UA. These are some protocols that you may or may not be familiar with, uh, but Ignition can pull that data from different places and distribute it to other places as well, in addition to being a hub of uh, communication and visualization and, uh, and being able to have folks log in and see things inside Ignition itself. One of the latest additions to Ignition uh, is the Business Connector module. 
This is from our MES partner, Cepasoft, and uh, we sell this module. Uh, it's listed right on our website. In fact, all of our pricing is listed right on our website, which is a little bit different inside this industry than a lot of other folks. Uh, but all, all of this is available uh, if you were to use the business connector. Uh, it is intended for connecting out to ERPs. Uh, and it can connect to other systems as well. But basically everyone who runs the Ignition MES modules requires an ERP system connection. Uh, and a lot of folks who aren't running MES uh, still are using an ERP for other features or other things that they need. This business connector makes some of those connections very easy. So for example, if you're using SAP, there's a certified SAP connector that is part of this. Um, there's actually two modules behind the scenes. There's an interface for SAP, as you see right there, and the Cephasoft Business Connector module. Those work in tandem together. If you're using other ERP systems, there's the Web Services module that works with all of it. This has a visual sequence builder, which you can see on the right-hand side there, for these communications. So it's very flexible. Um, the sequence engine behind the scenes allows for a variety of connections. And if you take a look below that, you can see some of those connections between different points there. Uh, and doing this also uh, allows you to avoid middleware. So some folks say, well, we're using SAP and we have these middleware pieces of software uh, because if you wanna connect up to SAP, you go through this middleware. Since Ignition now has this certified SAP connector because it's actually a certified SAP connector, often that means that it can connect directly to SAP and you don't need to worry about programming special interfaces uh, or having an SAP expert set up additional communications back and forth. You just plug into the features, the uh, BAPIs and other things that are available directly inside SAP. And as it's mentioned there, it has seamless NMES integration as well. Um, so it'll tie directly into MES objects if you're using Ignition's MES modules. So if we take a look at Ignition overall, and uh, this is the bottom line right here, the a number of things that are different about Ignition than other systems is the unlimited licensing model. And you'll see on the right, we list out all of those. So unlimited tags, unlimited clients, unlimited screens, unlimited users, unlimited connections, unlimited devices. Uh, there's no additional cost for putting more uh, tags on or more clients or more screens. At some point with a single server, uh, you might end up coming into hardware limitations where you might buy another copy of Ignition for another server, but those are generally really high limits. So 100 to 200 simultaneous visualizations. Uh, if you have uh, somewhere between 100,000 and a million tags on a single server, uh, same for history, depending on your rates, um, then a, a single server, if you have anything below that, then a single server generally will be able to handle everything that you need. All right, thanks so much, Kevin. Um, and sure, and there was a question that just came in actually, um, and I wanted to address that. Is there unknown limitations in the unlimited word? So, uh, so yeah, I think I actually did address that a little bit. Um, so there are hardware limitations. So the unlimited means the, the licensing is unlimited. Uh, at some point, you're going to exhaust the resources on a server. Um, so you're not going to be able to uh, have, uh, you know, your processor won't be able to handle anymore. You'll be running at 100% CPU or, or you won't have any more memory. But those uh, approximate limits that I just gave are where a typical customer might find that based on how they design things in Ignition that they're running into uh, something where they might want to spin up another server. So hopefully that answered the question for you. Great, thanks, and sorry for interrupting there. Um, so the, um, what I'm gonna focus on in my part of the presentation is um, now that you have this unlimited architecture in place, how you can best take advantage of that. And the story I'm going to tell is the story of a customer who had a very specific business goal they wanted to accomplish, um, and they wanted to use Ignition to accomplish this goal because they felt it was the best fit. I'm then going to talk a little bit about how after we accomplished that goal, we were able to get a lot of very easy, quick wins, 
quick ROI just because we had this unlimited infrastructure in place already. So this customer had an existing installa ignition installation and was doing some small things with it, um, collecting data and doing trending. Um, but with the release of the business connector module, they wanted to leverage it for its MES functionality to tie into their new ERP system. The project was set to go live in approximately six months, so this was an immediate challenge. Their goal was to have inventory reconciliation between the manufacturing operations and the ERP system, which would be considered the system of record. However, this wasn't strictly necessary because an ERP front end can handle all of this as well. So why should they spend the additional money on engineering a system that is not necessarily required? And after, on top of that, how can we get more benefits out of the system now that it's in place? So the first question we want to answer is why? How can we demonstrate an ROI to invest into the system? The first thing to note is often with ERP systems in manufacturing, you see a second computer on the shop floor. The operator moves from the HMI, um, the computer where they would be interacting with the piece of equipment for, for the machine to the ERP terminal to enter information such as raw materials consumed or finished goods created. This takes time and it also takes training on two systems. An alternate methodology would use paper records where the operator records something on paper, the paper is brought to a supervisor's office, someone from the office types in the information to another system, then the paper is filed away. This duplicates effort from the operator and the supervisor and the paper record is filed away somewhere that is inaccessible. Sorry, inaccessible. One of my favorite use cases is the accuracy of records. I see in just about every non-pharmaceutical factory I've ever been in, when someone is recording consumed goods against a bill of materials, they are entering information in the exact quantity as is found on the uh, sorry, as is found on the bill of materials. Um, this leads to inventory reconciliation issues later. Um, so in general, um, ERP interfaces that can be challenging to use, um, there's less paper on the factory floor, accuracy of records is important. Um, in terms of ROI though, we're able to reduce our training costs, reduce the total cost of ownership and build on infrastructure that can, leverage, that can be leveraged later. The first thing I'll talk about is the reduced training. A properly designed MES system means an operator does not even know they are using an MES system. Beyond starting and stopping work orders, information co collection can be automatic and complete. There is no additional training on specialized software. This means that onboarding operators uh, is a lot quicker um, and a lot more cost effective. So how do we solve this problem? Um, with this, we're using the business connector module. The advantage of Ignition for this particular project is that it's so open and flexible, we could connect to any number of machines, including injection molding, process machines, packaging machine, and even leverage Wi-Fi infrastructure for the warehouse. Using the business connector module allowed us to greatly reduce the overall amount of time spent engineering connectivity to the ERP system. We were able to download schedules and materials as well as consume materials and finished goods with very little development time. This helped us meet our six month timeline as we were able to reduce engineering effort from which in a normal project without the business connector probably would have been on the order of, of you know, six to 12 months um, down to three months. Um, which allowed us to meet our overall six month goal. Because of this reduced time and effort, it allowed us to reduce our costs to the client and allow them to achieve a much faster return on investment. We've also built a system that's very easy to maintain. The business connector allows us to automatically verify and save MES objects directly. So we do not have to spend any time configuring them manually when we are pulling the information directly out of the ERP system. It also allows us an easy way to synchronize changes in the future, helping with the maintainability and total cost of ownership of the system. You can imagine that for a company that's growing quickly and adding assets at a, f a fast rate, the maintainability of the system is an extremely important requirement. If it, were, if it were to take one week of effort to add a new machine to the system, the system's total cost of ownership would be probably too high and not worth the, the investment. However, using the business connector and the automatic MES object interface allows us to add a new piece of equipment in less than two hours of engineering work. It is also an easy task that we have trained the customer's personnel on, so they don't even need us to do it anymore. I spoke briefly about how ERP screens are 
difficult to use sometimes. Earpiece screens are great for trained employees. However, training takes time and having many people trained can be daunting. It also means when you are onboarding people, it is an additional cost, not to mention ERP systems have additional licensing costs for every workstations you add, though they do get the job done. You can see on the screen below, the, the, the graphical user interface has very small fields. It's very information heavy. There is a lot of text box, boxes to enter. Um, it's a cumbersome system to use. With an MES interface, they can be very intuitive and using the perspective module, they can be completely mobile as well. Oftentimes, with, when the system is designed properly, people do not even realize they were doing anything different. In this particular example, um, you can see a kind of a schedule below, um, which has a list of work orders from the ERP system. Uh, the operator simply has to press a start button when the work order is, is started and a stop button when the work order is complete. Um, pretty simple and the operator don't really know they're doing anything. The system handles all of the information collection. It handles it, consuming raw materials, issuing work in progress or finished goods created, um, as well as scrap parts uh, and handling quality samples as well. This means the operator is free to operate the machine. They can notice any downtime events quicker because they are not spending a large percentage of their time writing records and recording the information. This itself leads to a higher OEE, but I will speak a little bit later how leveraging the information we are already collecting for interfacing with the ERP system allows a very quick turnaround on adding OEE functionality as well. But this is pretty obvious, and I think maybe overstated these days, but you know, having no more paper is a huge advantage. Um, paper gets lost, damaged, and it gets dirty. This can be particularly important um, for pharmaceutical facilities. Um, you don't really want to be bringing paper into to clean rooms um, because it, it can be dirty. It's hard to keep clean. It can rip um, lots of other reasons for that. Um, usually with paper too, the information goes in a drawer somewhere. Um, and you don't do anything with it later, there's no chance to perform continuous improvement activities, um, advanced statistical process control or anything like that. As well, transcription errors can happen. Um, so if we're not validating the source of the data, um, somebody writes a, you know, a one instead of a seven, um, or somebody is reading a paper record and entering into a computer system also has the risk of creating that transcription error. Um, for this particular application, we were trying to reduce the duplication of effort because their current system involved writing information onto a piece of paper first and then bringing that somewhere else. But there are also, there are also lots of other benefits. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about a little bit as well about the information accuracy. So we talked a bit about transcription errors and how those can happen. Um, but I really wanted to focus on the, the benefits of automatic data collection. Oftentimes when we are in a manufacturing process and we are recording information or, or information regarding raw materials consumed, um, that information is recorded exactly as it is on the bill of materials. So if a product requires 100 kilograms of material A, 100.0 kilograms of material A are recorded in the, in the ERP system. However, what happens if it actually used 100.4 kilograms or 99.6? It is human nature to enter goods in the amount required rather than the actual amount. When you're doing this with a manual process, more than 75% of the time, people enter the actual amount on the bill of materials. Sometimes this doesn't matter when the unit of measure is in discrete parts, but oftentimes these errors can add up to thousands of dollars in used or extra inventory. If a process is in control, these often ba balance themselves out. Sometimes you add a little bit more, sometimes you add a little bit less, and in the end, the variance over a long period of time is, is negligible. However, often it is biased in one way or another. The, immediately the immediate accuracy improvement leads to inventory, sorry, the immediate accuracy in inventory levels helps this, but it is also a continuous improvement opportunity you will be able to realize what's gone wrong with your process, why it's going wrong, and fix that. That could mean that something is wrong, you know, with a tank system, um, you're putting too much of an ingredient in, you're not putting enough of one on a consistent basis, um, or it could mean that in your ERP system, the actual amount of an ingredient you need is more because of, you know, waste inherent in startup or start down 
uh, sequences. And that means the cost of your goods sold are not really accurate. Um, so being able to notice these long-term trends and do something about them um, really can have large financial benefits in a short period of time. So one of the other advantages of using an MES system as opposed um, as opposed to a separate um, automation system and a separate ERP handling system is to reduce the total cost of ownership. So although we talked a little bit about at, a little bit at the beginning of how we could use a separate automation system um, and use a separate ERP system and have the, the second workstation there and everything will work great. Um, and there is an upfront cost to that. Um, when you look at the cost over five years or over three years, or in this case, in particular case in, in one year, um, what does that mean? Um, with Ignition's unlimited licensing model, it means you don't have any extra fees when you add users or stations. So as you go to add machines, as your facility grows, there's no additional cost to you. Um, if you were to go with a different model, you'd be paying those recurring fees over a period of time. As I mentioned a couple of times, we'll have reduced training. Um, so that is an ongoing operational expense that you won't have anymore. Um, you'll have reduced record keeping costs um, and you let your operators operate. Uh, let them focus on what they're good at. Let them notice the machines, let them see faults when they're happening and correct those faults as soon as possible. Um, this will lead to a higher OEE on itself, but and I'll talk, you know, on the next slide a little bit about um, how we can also, you know, use this information to measure OEE and improve that by making it more visual. So this, I'm going to talk about how we leverage our ignition infrastructure to get more quick wins. Something I really enjoyed about this project and ignition in general is once the infrastructure is in place, it is easy and flexible to add on to your system. In this particular case, because we were handling all of the work orders, which required us to automatically collect part counts and scrap information, it was very easy to add on an OEE solution. This required us to just start collecting machine downtime and reasons for each piece of equipment. For this customer, we modified PLC logic so that we could collect the downtime as well as the downtime reasons based on faults that existed in the PLC. This allows us to quickly prioritize the faults um, and see which ones are happening the most frequently and what faults are causing the most duration. We added on a new Cepasoft module, which was the OEE module, um, and it took about one minute to get us out of the box and installed. Um, we then had to you know, map some tags on the OEE module to the new PLC logic we added, um, and we were able to get quick wins. So we were able to bring up um, approximately 40 machines on with OEE because we had all of this infrastructure in place already. Um, it took us approximately two hours per machine to bring them online, um, as well as a little bit of overhead time developing our, you know, a PLC template to add on to the equipment so that we could easily map downtime reasons. Um, if we only wanted to monitor downtime and have an operator manually enter the reasons, that would have been a much quicker turnaround. But the automatic downtime reason collection is another huge time saver. It also prevents, you know, different operators from recording different downtime events differently. Um, and it again makes a kind of, you know, a one click solution. Like um, I showed a, a few screens ago, you press the start button on a work order and the MES system does the rest, re sorry, does the rest. Similarly, uh, with statistical process control, it was another easy add-on. There was a, a few new pieces of equipment that were fitted with high precision machine vision measurement information. So that we were using cameras to measure, you know, millimeter and sub-millimeter dimensions on certain parts. Um, we were measuring, you know, temperatures and process flows and forces and, um, you know, it, for each particular piece of equipment we were making, we were taking about 60 to 70 measurements. Um, that's all great, except that, you know, if somebody has to review 60 or 70 measurements for 10,000 parts, um, they're going to be sitting there forever and not know exactly what they need to do. Um, so using the statistical process control model, uh, we were able to set up uh, an SPC sample for each of those 60 to 70 points. And it will tell us things like, are we going out of control? Um, is 
are we deviating from the mean? Are we trending in one direction or the other? Um, and something else that's really cool about that module um, is they have a what they call a CPP and a CPK tool. Um, and for those of you that are in you know manufacturing with dimensional de types of devices, you'll know that you know oftentimes your customers are going to want that piece of information. It's a, a statistic that shows that you're capable of producing you know uh, what they call a six sigma process, so three defects per. Uh, million, I think is, I think that's what Six Sigma is. It's been a while since I've, I've looked at the number. Um, but that just comes right out of the box. So you one click and you can send a report off to your client. There's no reason to sit there, tabulate the information into Minitab or, or Excel, um, spit out a report and send that along to your customer. And, you know, if they were to come in to audit you, if it's a, you know, a pharmaceutical uh, customer, um, you're able to demonstrate that you know, to them on the shop floor, which is a pretty powerful tool. Um, what was cool about this was an, another piece of equipment was being made in Europe um, with similar measurement informa information that was being designed to produce a different part. And we were able to load up a laptop running ignition. Um, and thanks to, to Kevin and his team, we were able to get a demonstration license that let us run it for a week. However, uh, even with the uh, even with no license, you are able to run for, for a couple of hours at a time in, in demonstration mode. Um, so we sent that on a laptop to Europe and we were able to FAT that portion of the project before it arrived on site too, which let us start up the equipment in, in you know, two weeks instead of four um, because all of the MES, including the, um, including the OEE, including the work order handling was all able to be tested in Europe um, and any interfacing be between the machine was fixed in the interim. Um, the software was re-downloaded when it got to site and everything was pretty seamless. Um, so what I'm also excited about with this particular project is what is next? We are currently evaluating machine learning and artificial intelligence to see how we can get more value out of all of the data we are collecting. Um, you know, we talked about SPC and, and the data points a little bit. So this this client is collecting, you know, approximately 1 million data points a month now. Um, and that's growing pretty fast as they, as they're scaling up their production. Um, so we're, we're trying, we've got a couple of open-ended questions, you know, can we relate machine parameters to downtime? Can we predict failures? Can we look into process parameters and see how they affect scrap product? Um, we don't have answers to these questions yet. Um, but we have a solid infrastructure in place and with the unlimited and open nature of the connections and induction and inductive automations ignition platform, we're gonna be finding out soon. Um, transferring information from their historian for, or, or to, a, to an SQL database to an, a cloud-based machine learning platform is uh, seamless. We started to do it and we're excited to see what results we're gonna get. Um, so I want to thank everybody for their time. Um, it looks like we'll be giving a, a little bit of time back, um, which is great. I do have a few questions um, that I'll be looking at. If there's anything else, please populate in the chat and we will try to get to it. Um, in the meantime, I'll, I'll go ahead and start reading. All right. So our first question was, we, you talked about um, SPC and OEE being some quick wins. Can you talk about some other quick wins that you can achieve? Um, that's a great question. Uh, we looked at you know, the two that were most important to this customer. Um, the other thing that we're looking at that I didn't really s speak much about um, is the recipe system. Um, so Cepasoft also has a recipe and change order module. And what we were looking at doing now is, is integrating the recipe with the ERP system. So oftentimes you'll find, um, you know, someone in quality or someone in a, in a design department will make changes to a bill of materials or a recipe. Um, and getting those changes down onto the shop floor are, are challenging. What we'll be able to do with Business Connector um, is take recipe values out of the ERP system and move those down through MES into the automation system and then verify that they've not changed. Um, this can vary in, in, in importance depending on what industry you're in. It's you know, particularly important in, in regulated industries, chemicals, food and beverage, pharmaceuticals, um, but it can also help in other industries where quality control is, is of the utmost important, sorry, utmost importance. I hope that answered your question. Um, the next question, um, I, 
Does Ignition connect to Allen Bradley control logics and Siemens S7-1500 PLCs? Can you see the tags automatically or do you need to import tag lists? Uh, Kevin, I think that's probably a better question for you. Sure, sure, yeah. And and yes, absolutely, uh, connects to both of those. For the Siemens, the uh, Siemens protocol, if you're connecting to older Siemens devices, um, and I think this is true for every platform, you do need to import lists. But if you're connecting to the newest Siemens, uh, it's really nice. The S7-1500 has the OPC UA built into it, and so it allows browsing. You don't have to worry about any tag lists. You don't have to worry about any imports with, with any of that either. Um, I see a related question that just came in as well that said, can we talk OPC DA? And the answer is yes, absolutely. So uh, there's uh, Ignition as an OPC COM module that allows for Ignition to be an OPC DA client. It's not an OPC DA server, but it is an OPC DA client. And Ignition actually has a tunneler module too. So if you've ever talked to OPC DA over a network, you'll probably uh, have stories about trying to set up DCOM and uh, you know get that working over the network. Uh, the tunneler allows it so that you can just install that locally next to the DA server and then tunnel it over standard networks where you don't need to worry about the COM layer. You don't need to worry about opening ports and the rest of that. Uh, it's uh, just a nice, simple connection there um, from one side to the other. Thanks. I, I guess I learned something on this webinar too. I didn't realize we could tag browse S7-1500 PLCs now. So that uh, that's good to know. I guess that's why I'm a recovering automation engineer and not an automation engineer. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a, you know, we, we were really happy when they added that too, because it had been a request for so long and Siemens just didn't make it available. They didn't have anything in the protocol. And, you know, now that they have OPC UA, they do. Great. Um, so next question is, um, you mentioned the benefits of a reduction of operator training. Can you quantify that at all? Um, so yes, I, I can quantify it for this particular customer. Um, generally, they were doing a, you know, a, a two hour training session for each of their operators. Um, so this facility has 100 operators um, with a turnover of approximately 15% and a growth rate of approximately 10%. Um, so the initial cost would be 200 operator hours of training um, plus, you know, 10, you know, 15% every year in turnover and another 10% um, in growth every year. Um, depending on what your hourly rates are. Um, it, so you can, you know, you can start thinking about, you know, you know, twenty to thirty thousand dollars upfront, and then an ongoing cost every year. Um, that said, not every customer is going to have operators that were meant to interact with the ERP system. So you may not, you know, may, you may not need to train a hundred people. You may only need to train ten or twenty. Um, but it's a pretty easy thing to calculate. And if you have any additional questions about that, I'm happy to help kind of help you demonstrate an ROI. Um, it's one of those ones. You know, not every problem has a quick and easy ROI solution, but this one actually does. Um, next question, um, is the SAP connector certified? Or sorry, is the SAP connector SAP certified? I, Kevin, I think you can speak to that. Sure, yeah, yeah, and it is. So um, that is a good question because that, you know, that, that gets to whether or not you can make a direct connection there from SAP for certain uh, folks and other folks that can't. I think I answered that as I was going through the uh, slides already, but uh, I'm glad that somebody asked just so um, I could uh, focus on that a little bit more too. The, um, the, the reason why that's important is that direct connect so that you don't have to go through middleware so that you're able to, um, to make that a uh, basically something that's uh, been tested by SAP or, or verified to be compatible. And I believe that's uh, that's certified both for HANA and uh, you know the older SAP um, functionality there as well. Great. And just to add, for this particular project, we weren't. I think I've said particular a bunch, and it's sticking out in my mind now. Um, but um, we were not using SAP. We were using Business Connector with web services, as you talked about earlier. Um, but we have used the SAP connector in a lot of places, and it's you know, great product, just bring out those bappies and map them to tags and super quick process. Um, next question, you talked about some of the unforeseen benefits, but what kind of unforeseen challenges occurred? Um, like any automation or IT projects, um, 
there are lots of challenges that you, you just do not expect to happen. Um, I think the biggest one is, you know, user experience and what that looks like um, and making that process a lot more, you know, iterative, agile, upfront with the customer. Um, I remember the first iteration of a project we gave to them, they were, the, you know, they probably had 10 or 12 different things on the interface that they wanted to change, how the information looked and felt. Um, but working with them upfront um, really allowed us to reduce um, a lot of those problems and bring them early into the design um, so that we weren't, you know, doing a bunch of visual engineering near the end of a project. Um, the other big challenge for this was, of course, the timeline, um, something I kind of glossed over, but they were actually bringing up a new ERP system and the MES system at the same time. So the timelines were meant to converge. Um, where typically we, with an MES project, we'll see an ERP system that exists already and we're kind of tying into that. So there's no work on that end. Um, that was a big problem for us because, um, you know, there was obviously some kinks that came up with communications and how we, we fed information back and forth you know, they did get worked out. We did have a sandbox environment, but it, because it was kind of not a, a stable, long-term supported ERP implementation, and we had some issues just at the start getting things going. Um, what other ERP systems can Ignition connect to besides ER, besides SAP? Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll go on and say, per, particularly with Particularly with Grantech, we've used it con to connect to SAP Business One as well as, as Oracle. Um, Kevin, I don't know if you have any specifics, but as far as I know, um, with the Web Services module, uh, we can connect to any of any of them. Yeah, that's uh, that's accurate. So we can. So I think that we've never found an ERP system that a customer has been looking to connect to that can't be connected to. Um, some of them are very quick connections. Some of them take a little bit of work to uh, get things set up on. Um, but in general, yeah, you can connect to, to absolutely anything. So we're connecting to anything from Plex to Maximo to, um, well, uh, IBM actually has a bunch of different ERPs. Uh, Maximo is kind of an ERP and kind of a scheduler. But <laughs> I mean, there's, uh, you know, the, yeah, you mentioned Oracle there, the so EBS, the uh, eBusiness Suite. And, the um, yeah, there's there's just so many of them out there, um, and using the business connector plus that web services module gives you access to be able to make that connection in a way that's a lot easier than it would be if you're just programming directly against interfaces. All right, our our final question: um, How do I see Ignition on my phone, um, and is it a cloud hosted service? Yeah, I can I can answer that. Uh, so you can either have Ignition in the cloud or you can have it on-prem, but it's not, don't think of Ignition as a cloud-hosted service. Ignition is uh, software that installs on a server. Um, and if you want to see things on your phone, uh, you can do that through the Ignition uh, visualization tools there that uh, if you're on-premise, you can connect over uh, Wi-Fi generally to your local system if you have the security rules in place for that. If you want to access it online, we have a security hardening guide and we have some uh, guidance on how to do that on our website. If you wanna do it just where you have your phone and you're not connected to a VPN or you're not connected to Wi-Fi and you're getting access to that, um, there's a few different options in place there as well. But if you go to our, our demo.ia.io or download our, our web app, you're gonna see it running on your phone um, on the internet. So we have a growing number of folks who are doing that. Um, a good percentage of customers who are running online are just doing it over VPN uh, for added security there. And that can be a good security measure for keeping everything encrypted and um, secured and with an extra layer of username and password authentication. Um, but we, we inside the security hardening guide, it has information about two-factor authentication and making sure that uh, you're doing best practices for securing your system. So if you did put something um, that's just on the internet, you're going to have some of the security best practices in place if you're following that uh, to try to make sure that you secure the system as best as you can. Awesome. Uh, no, I'm, I've been playing around actually with the, the Ignition Maker Edition to try to get it working on my phone to control my pool. Um, and that's my, <laughs> summer pro that's my summer project. Um, and it's, it's pretty cool as a tinkerer. Um, it's a, it's a lot of fun to work with too. 
That's great. I, I actually made an app myself. I, I just had a daughter. And uh, so she's about four months old and her weight was a little bit low. So I made a weight tracking app that uh, integrates with the scale that we have that uh, we throw her on and we capture her weight and uh, it's all trended out and, you know, taking a look at the uh, expected growth weights and uh, you've got your upper lower and lower limit essentially there in the graphs. Um, and my wife uses it as well. So uh, it's, yeah, there, you, you can do just about anything that you want in there. It's fun. Awesome. All right. Um, so that's it. Um, I want to thank everybody for coming today. We really appreciate your time. Um, I hope that you learned anything or I, I hope that you learned something rather. Um, any questions uh, you can see on the slide here, please send them to info at grantech.com. Um, you'll get a copy of the recording of this later today, um, as well as a copy of the slides. Um, and again, just thanks so much for attending. Hope you have a great rest of your day. And Ryan, I wanted to say thank you for inviting me as well to, to be part of this. Uh, we really appreciate our relationship with Grand Tech and you guys do great work. So um, it's good talking to you today and good being here with everyone. Thanks a lot, Take Kevin. Care. Take care, everyone.